All right, hey, we're gonna get started. I need two volunteers real quick, just two volunteers to play a quick game. Super easy, it's a 50-50, one of those 50-50 kind of games, so I just need, uh, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna, Eric gonna volunteer? You just gotta be able to ring a bell, that's it. I need, I got Eric, give Eric a hand, one more, one more. Don't be, sh don't be afraid, this is not gonna, you won't be, it won't be awkward. You volunteering somebody to make you come up. Just one. Oh, all right, Jacob. Come on up here. All right. Eric and Jacob, here we go. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. All right. Here it is. We're going to play a really easy game. Okay, I'm going to, it's called Bible or Blasphemy. All right. Let me tell you, Bible or Blasphemy works. We read, we read a, 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 I read something that's on my screen here, and you got to ring the bell to tell us if it's Bible or blasphemy. In other words, is it in the Bible or is it not in the Bible? Okay, so it's Bible if it's in the if it's a verse, Bible scripture. Bible. Bible or blasphemy. Those are your two choices. Ready? Bible or blasphemy. Okay, so let me get you guys ready. You're going to ring the bell. Whoever rings the bell, someone's got to keep score here for me because I, I don't do math. Um, Sarah's got it. She's ready to go. So you guys can leave a hand on the table. That's fine. First one to ring in, we have, we'll call your name before you answer. You got to tell us. Now remember, it's 50-50. So if you get it wrong, the other person gets the point. Does that make sense? Because it's one or the other. Okay, ready? So we're going to do it. So you can kind of get the way the game goes. So the first one today is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, uh, this is a good test one. God helps those who help themselves. Bible? No, blasphemy is not in the Bible. I'm oh, sorry. But you get the idea. That's how the game goes. Okay, ready? Great. All right, Bible blasphemy. Eric gets a point. Okay, ready? Next one. <laughs> Noah's wife was named Joan. It was not. Joan of Arc mm. was not <laughs> Noah's. Oh, Noah's yeah. life. Okay. All right. You got the idea. Okay. All right. But you get it. But here you go. Win by not winning. I like it. Okay. That's good. Uh, next one. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he didn't give glory to God. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Bible. That is in the Bible. It is Acts chapter 12. Very good. All right. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Bible? No, Gandhi. Gandhi, 1929. It's all right. Uh, here we go. It's all right. A priest cut up his mistress into 12 pieces. Not in the Bible. No, oh, that is in the Bible. <laughs> it's in Judges chapter 19. Verse 29. <laughs> all right. It's okay. We're, we're all learning here today. This is okay. Some of you didn't know that, so he's just man up to men. All right. All right. That's why nobody wanted to be in this game. Okay. God won't give you more than you can handle. In the Bible? It is not in the Bible. Blasphemy. It's all right. It's all right. You might, you might win by losing. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. You're good. All right. Ready? Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. Bible or blasphemy? <laughs> blasphemy. That's right. <laughs> Try this dragon. All right. This dragon. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's an open book test. It's fine. You can have help. Okay. All right. That's right. And uh, I went out by night to the valley gate, to the dragon spring, into the dung gate, inspected the walls, and they were broken down and been destroyed by fire. The dragon spring and the dung gate. You rang it. What is it? No, oh, it's in the Bible. There is. No, I don't miss, I'm just quoting scripture. There is a dragon gate. Uh, here we go. Just a couple more. Love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. Uh, someone's got to commit. Someone's got to. Shakespeare. All right. All right. It's all right. It's all right. There's many versions of this game. Don't worry. Okay. And uh, here we go. My son, ask for thyself another kingdom, for that which I leave is too small for thee. Beverly? 
blasphemy. That is King Philip of Macedonia to his son Alexander, also known as Alexander the Great. All right, I believe this is the last one. Um, and, and since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix. <laughs> Acts chapter 27. All right, that's it. Give him a hand. All right, have a seat. That's fine. I don't know who kept score. Do we have a winner, Jake? All right, Jake won? Okay. By one point. By one point. All right, we will figure out a prize for you later. Apparently, it's a Bible. Well, we'll give you both Bibles. Okay. <laughs> that, might be, that might be the prize that we have to give. Okay. All right. So listen, as we begin the new year, <laughs> always a good game. We will play that again. It's been a while. Okay. One of our favorites. So as we begin the new year, there's a really good chance, there's a really good chance that you took the turning of the calendar as an opportunity to as kind of reboot, right? Reboot. Uh, your life. So you took a break, you turn everything, you know, you turn yourself off and back on again. Maybe you felt like that. Hopefully, now everything in your life is running smoother, right? You break some old habits, you start some new ones. And if we're going to ask most Christians, you know, most Christians are going to say one of their spiritual goals are what? Spend more time with God. I want to spend more time with God this year. Uh, prayer and reading the Bible usually top the, the, the list of the things that we know we should do, that we plan to do, but maybe we don't always get around to. Okay, we're now two weeks into the new year, so technically I think at this point at something like uh, 80% of New Year's resolutions have all been broken, okay, statistically. Now, whenever I see people struggling with their faith or struggling in particular circumstances or struggling uh, with some things, I usually ask them two questions. First of all, have you prayed about it, right? Have you prayed about it? Uh, or this one, well, how much time have you spent reading your Bible? And the two answers are usually no and not much, right? Have you prayed about it? Uh, no. Have you spent some time reading your Bible? Not really. Okay. Or I like this one. Yeah, I know I should. To which my next question, of course, is, well, then why aren't you, right? These are the questions. So if you know, you know. These are the answers. Now, these are the, uh, and then when I ask them that question, why haven't you, the answers vary but are pretty common. They usually kind of go along like, uh, they usually go along like this. Uh, I don't have time. I don't take the time. I'm not sure where to start. I get distracted. I used to, but, you know, and fill in the blank, okay? And so we talk about spending some time in the Word and reading the Word and having this quiet time with God. You know, these are, these are, these are questions that come up all the time. Now, I'm going to be bold enough to say that the root of maturity and comfort and strength and wisdom and direction that you are looking for is found in the pages of Scripture. And I don't just mean reading the Psalms or reading Proverbs, which are awesome, by the way. I'm talking about all of Scripture, the whole counsel of Scripture. And, and when Jesus asked his disciples if they were going to abandon him because his teachings were hard, because Jesus said some pretty difficult things, and everyone kind of like, dude, I'm out. That's, that's crazy. I'm out. Jesus asked his questions to his disciples. Are you going to leave me too? And Peter said this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And this is something we need to keep in mind. Albert Moeller, uh, he's, president, he's the president of uh, the Southern Baptist Seminary for a while. Uh, he, he was citing some Barner research, and he said this. He says, fewer, check out the, these stats, fewer than half of all adults can name the four Gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. According to data from Barna Research Group, 60% of Americans can't name even five of the ten commandments. Barna says this, no matter, no wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are. The bottom line, and this is what he says, increasingly America is biblically illiterate. Some of the statistics, and we joked about this, but some of the statistics are enough to perplex even those aware of the problem, they say. A Barna poll indicated that 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Another survey of graduating high school students revealed that 50% that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife, and a considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated they thought, they thought the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. Their conclusion? Their conclusion? We are in big trouble. Okay? 
And if you don't, it would know that it was, it was preached by, by Jesus. Okay, so the questions then, how can we be hope to be led by God? How can we hope to be led by God when we don't open up the guidebook that he's provided for us? How many of our prayers have already been answered in the pages of God's revelation? It's an important question. This is the important question. Do you know God's word? Do you know what the Bible says? Can you tell me or tell somebody else what the Bible does or does not say? Can you defend what you believe or articulate it based on what the Word of God says? Can you be ready in season and out of season because this is what Scripture teaches? And when someone makes statements about the Bible, which, by the way, if you're on the Internet, people make statements about the Bible all the time, pretty, usually pretty uninformed, whether it's in the pulpit or in a coffee shop, and someone makes a comment, are you able to agree or disagree with those statements because you know what God's Word says, Right? So these are important questions. You know, can you tell someone what the Bible actually says about love and about money and about sex and about our attitudes and about language and death and life and compassion and hope? Can you communicate these truths to people? Or are your opinions of these things formed by social media or someone else telling you what God's word says? Okay? Look, I love that you're all in here today listening to me. I, that makes me feel really good about myself, right? But you know what? I, how many of you, if I say something out here, can say... That's true, because you've read it in the Word. I'm going to tell you right now, I try to be diligent and faithful to the Word of God, but if I misspeak, I need you to hold me accountable to that. And how will you do that? Unless you are reading the Bible. I've been corrected before, and I need to be. I love, I was listening to Rob Morgan last night in church, and he said, he said something in a passage. I'm like, I've never, I don't, how have I missed that? I've read that book a dozen times. But it just, and so I'm like flipping through. I'm like, yeah, no, it's in there. Oh, yeah, it's been there the whole time. You know, these are good to know. That's why it is so important when we talk about reading our Bibles to set aside time to open up God's Word and to read it, and to read it every day, and, and to know the stories, to hear God's heart. And, and because, listen, you cannot live truth if you do not know truth. Okay? You can't live truth if you don't know truth. That's why everybody has their own truth, right? Oh, well, I'm speaking my truth. Well, that doesn't mean anything because you don't know what true, genuine truth truth is. So I'm going to take a minute before we talk about how to have a quiet time, which is what I, I, I said we'd talk about, is to talk about why the word of God matters in your life. Why is this important? And it was fun. I wrote this message and I was listening to a sermon that basically talked about it and I was so encouraged this week. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is, I think our Awana verse comes out of there, right? The Awana verse comes out of here and he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and you firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So based on this passage, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons, several reasons why the word of God is so important and why we should be spending time in it. And I'm going to tell you, first of all, the Word of God leads us to salvation, right? The Word of God, it says, makes you wise for salvation. In Romans 10, 17, he says, faith, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is in the Word of God. It is in the pages of the Bible. And not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it permeates all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, okay? The Word of God leads us to salvation. The second reason is because the word of God teaches us God's promises. He says, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. God has been making promises from the beginning. Do you know that Jesus Christ was promised back in Genesis chapter 3? That the serpent will bite your heel, but he will crush your head as a gospel promise. And that happened at the cross. God reveals his plans and intents through the Bible, whether it's you know Romans 8.28, right? We know all things... We know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good and called according to his promises. That is a, that is a sacred writing. John 14, 23, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that and go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that there were I am, you may be also. These are promises of God that are in the scriptures. It also, the word of God reveals heavenly mysteries. The Bible says it's profitable for teaching. 
You know, look, ideas about God, and guess what? People have all kinds of ideas about God. Ideas about God are just ideas. They're just ideas until they're mined from the truth of God's word. How do we learn about God and about his heart? Through the word. How do we tell other people about God's mysteries? By teaching them the Bible. People want to say they, know, they want to know God, and there's, this, there's this, this movement sometimes, and you hear about people like, well, if I just go find a quiet place and I listen, God will speak to me. You know, God's going to reveal things to me. And, 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 you know, and sometimes that's what people want to do. And guess what? He already did. You don't have to go to a quiet place and look for and let's wait, you know, for the, for the dew to fall upon your brow and the halo to come. Because it's right here, okay? It's in black and white. You want to know what God has to say, read your Bible. I like this one too. The Word of God protects us from wrong choices, right? He says for reproof and for correction. So God gives us what? A standard of right and wrong. He tells us what sin is. He tells us what righteousness is. He tells us that if we accept the truth, that the Bible is God's word, that, that we accept it as a guide, that, that these are, it's going to guide us in the way we should go. Jesus is described as a cornerstone, and a cornerstone in construction is the basis upon which everything else is built. When you lay a cornerstone, every other brick is lined up to that cornerstone, vertically, vertically horizontally. And if you get that stone wrong, the rest of the foundation is wonky. But when its stone is right, and it is in Christ, then everything else builds correctly, and God's word serves as a cornerstone for our lives. That's why when we compare ourselves, that's why we compare ourselves to God's word. When we want to know what needs to happen in our life, we compare ourselves to God's word, not other people. Because guess what? I'll always do better than other people. And even if I'm not doing better than other people, I will find someone I'm doing better than. Because he said, well, who does that? Well, is, the moment you say, well, at least I don't, I, at least I haven't killed anybody because apparently that's like the bare minimum standard, right? Good for you, right? Look, we compare ourselves to God's word, not other people, because the Bible reveals if we've deviated from God's design, from God's cornerstone, from God's direction. It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you, by the way, some of you are not going to like this next statement. It doesn't matter if you agree with it. Why? Because truth is truth whether or not we choose to agree with it. Something doesn't become untrue because you don't like it. You can treat it like it's not true, but it doesn't change the fact that it's true. Okay? And there are people who try to disprove the Bible all the time. You know what happens to those people? They become Christians. Right. Like, oh, never mind. The harder people try to to push against the Bible and the more the evidence mounts of the veracity and truth of God's word, the more likely those people become Christ followers. The word of God also, it guides us to right living. It says it is good for training in righteousness. How do I know what a life pleasing to God looks like? We talked about it last week. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God, which is what we're talking about today. It's found in scripture. Psalm 119 is a great one. Uh, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And the word of God prepares us for life. I love this that the man of God might be complete and equipped for every good work. You want to get ready to go and live life. Know the word of God. That will get you ready. I don't care what your job title is. We have people from, you know, we have people from engineers to sales to whatever. Whatever your job is, the word of God can equip you and prepare you for life. Theodore Roosevelt said this. He said, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. And this is free. So there's that too. So that's good. Okay. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does, he prospers. Now, preaching is great. I love listening to good sermons. It's great. Christian books, Christian living books are fine. None of those things is a replacement for God's word. There's no Christian author out there who has something better to say than what the Bible already says. Okay, There is no preacher out there worth his salt who has anything better to say than what God says. Do you know why you like coming to listen to people like Pastor Jeremiah and Rob Morgan? Because they are preaching the word of God. 
That's what they're doing. And if a preacher gets up and is not preaching the word of God, then what are you teaching? If you're not up here with a Bible and scripture, then what are they sharing with you? Good advice. I can get that anywhere. This is truth. Now, if the word of God is as important as I say it is, and I think it is important, obviously, what, and, and, and that the word of God is what I need to interact with in order to, as Micah 6, 8 says, walk humbly with God, then how? And this is where I want to land. I want to talk to you today about how to have a quiet time. Because I think people struggle with this. I think people really have a hard time getting into this rhythm and getting into this thing and, 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 and just doing it and, just, and, and, and deciding how they're going to read it. Because I think we overcomplicate it, by the way. I really, really do think that we overcomplicate it. And so I want to make today kind of practical. I firmly believe that your time with God will change your life. And I want to make it as practical and applicable and walk with you through the basics of having a quiet time or devotional time, or whatever you want to call it. And the point is that you do it, and in doing it, allow God to transform you. I've, I've shared with you, I, I used to bribe my high school students. Uh, I called it the uh, uh, you know, 30-day challenge. I'd say, if you guys read your Bible every day for a month, I'll buy you dinner wherever you want, right? Like I'd straight up buy the expensive restaurant. And I gave them, and I said, and it had a little card, and they would turn it in. It was an honor system. And, um, and, I, and I bought a lot of meals with this, and I was really, really glad I did. But it was funny because these kids were like, oh, we're going to take you to the most expensive restaurant. I'm like, let's go. Bet. I'll take, it. I'll take you on the bet right now. And they would do this, and, 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 and I'd sit, as we'd sit, they said, well, tell me what God taught you this, this month as you've read the Bible. And the best part about that was that every single one of these kids thought that they were getting a free expensive meal on Pastor George, and the reality was these kids' lives were transformed by the word of God. I saw every single one of them change. The one, you could tell the ones that did it because they were different. They acted differently. Their thought processes and their heart was, was different. And I'm like, if I could, I'm going to tell you right now, if I could pay $50 or whatever I paid for a meal and see people's lives transformed, I'd be shelling out U.S. grants all day long, okay? Because I know, and that's how firmly I believe in the word of God, that if you spend time in it, it will transform you. So like any exercise, it's going to feel awkward at first and uncomfortable. And as soon as you get used to it, you're going to look forward to it. And then eventually you're going to crave it, feeling like the day isn't right unless you've taken the time to spend with God. Just like tithing challenges us that if we give 10% to God, he'll take 90% and do even more with it than we can do on our own. So does spending time with God as part of our day make the rest of the day go better. And at least you're in the right frame of mind to manage whatever comes your way. So I'm going to give you, here's my, here's my tips on how to have a quiet time. And I'm telling you stuff that has worked for me and I think can work for you. God is, I have been, I don't say this arrogantly, I've been pretty faithful and consistent with it. And when I don't do it, I notice. Okay, so I'm telling you what's worked for me and hopefully this will work for you. Number one, have a plan. And what do you mean by that? Well, people have said that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, Right? So intentionally take it, make it a part of your to-do list. Make spending time in the Word part of your to-do list. If you're someone who likes to plan all the things that you do in a day, and you know who you are, from work to meeting to shopping and, and catching a movie, then adding read my Bible to the list will help you remember that this is something that needs to be accomplished today. And again, I say today because here's why. A lot of people are like, I'm going to read the Bible every day this week or every day this month or every day this year. No, you're not. Don't even try. Make it your goal to read the Bible today. You can, you can handle today. Worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Because let me tell you what happens. If you say, I'm going to read the Bible every day this year, and you miss today, what happens? Your whole year is shot. So don't blow up your whole year. Take care of today. There's a big difference in the mindset. Look, there's a big difference in the mindset of saying, I should, and knowing that you will because you wrote it down, and you made it part of your plan. And if you think it sounds forced and unnatural, well, if, you, if, you're, if, if you're already not doing it naturally, then maybe you need to develop the habit by planning on doing it every day. Put it on your to-do list. It's not that hard. And, and you can even block it out in your calendar. I will read my Bible in the morning while I drink my coffee, or I will carve out time on my lunch break. Either way, I don't care how specific you get, it just becomes part of the thing that you have to do today. And I recommend doing it in the morning, okay? Because the day gets really busy really fast, amen? Okay, it sets a tone for the day, it keeps you from trying to cram it all in at night when all your brain really wants to do is scroll Instagram, okay? Or you're like, I'm going to sit and read my Bible and I'm going to pray in bed right before I go to sleep. <laughs> okay? You know who you are. 
So unless you're reading at night and setting it up to, to, with the express purpose of preparing for the next day, starting your day with God's word will get you on the right track. He says in Psalm 143, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Start your day right with time with God. Second thing we want to do is not just have a plan, but have a purpose. Why am I doing this? Why am I reading the Bible? We kind of already talked about this, but here's two reasons that you're reading the Bible in case you know them. Number one, to know and to grow. To know God because God desires a relationship with you. He already knows everything about you, and reading God's word gives you the chance to know everything you need to know about him. I wish I could know God better. He's like, please read the book. I will tell you anything you want to know that I've already told you. And to grow. As we've already talked about, knowing God's word leads to greater maturity, not just because it's full of wisdom and lessons, but because it comes backed by the power of the Holy Spirit Like the psalm says, you become like a tree planted by streams of water. And besides the general will of God, there are specific things the Bible can teach you. Know why you're getting in the Bible. Know what you desire to come out of it. And if these reasons on their own don't motivate you, you need to find a purpose and a reason to read God's word. Maybe you want to find out everything God's word says about relationships. Maybe you want to find out everything God's word says about money. It's all in there. My current devotion Bible is a New Living Translation Bible that I got from, guess where? Goodwill. And... Whoever had it before me seemed really, really keen in in, in what God's word had to say about money and prosperity, but they highlighted all those passages in green. It's pretty funny. I'm walking. The Lord will bless you. Highlighted. It's just funny to find. But you can do that with scripture. Look to see what God's word says about it. Just have a purpose. Next, have a place. What do you mean, George? Have a place. My devotional place is in the dining room. There's my setup right there. I've got my Bible, my journal, and my currently in my Alistair bag devotional. The lemons just make it look really Instagrammable. Um, (laughs) I can sit there. I can sit there with the light coming in the window, Bible open, and a place for my coffee. It's consistent. It's convenient. It's comfortable. You need to know where you're going to spend time in God's Word and make it part of the routine. Keep a reminder or keep your Bible there or so it's clearly marked as this is my Bible space. Try to avoid your clutter so your Bible doesn't just become another part of the pile that you have to move. Where's my Bible? Oh, it's under the laundry. Not a good thing, okay? Part of the rhythm of time with God is having a place to meet up with him. Daniel did. Daniel, from the book of Daniel, did. Look what it says. Uh, It says, when Daniel knew the document had been signed, okay, this goes back to right before the lion's den, he went to his house where he had the windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God. What does it say? As he had done previously. That window was his spot. That was his spot. And that's where he spent time with God. You need to have a spot. Here's another one that's going to frustrate some of you. Have a paper Bible. Have a paper Bible. Paper Bible. Okay, why? Because, look, it's awesome you have a Bible app on your phone. It is the first app that I downloaded when I got a smartphone because I felt more spiritual. But you know what else is on my phone? Everything. Everything. Instagram, social media, news, messages, Amazon. And it's so easy to get distracted. A paper Bible will help keep you focused, and you can highlight in it. You can write in it. You can draw in it. You can create memories with it. Not only that, research confirms that reading comprehension and retention are higher with print books over digital. Okay? The science is there. Okay? Part of that is how your brain processes information. You might remember something based on where it is on the page that you're looking at, and you'll know where to find it. When I changed Bibles, it screwed me up because all the verses I was looking for that were down here or now up here. It took me a while to relearn where they were, but I did. And we read paper differently than we read screens. We treat the information on our screens differently than the info on paper. We actually, science shows, devalue information on our phones, information on our screens, right? I mean, come on. How many reels and posts do you actually remember after you see them? Gone, okay? Also, find a translation that you can read that's accurate, it's easy to read. Here's, here's George's recommendations. Okay, I, I recommend the ESV or the New King James because they're translatable, because the translations are good and they're reliable. I enjoy the New Living Translation because it's readable and it handles the scripture well while being accessible to different reading levels. If you have a, a reading 
disorder or struggle with that, the New Living is a great option, and it translates correctly. These translations, okay, since the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, they are reliable and they are consistent. And there's just something powerful about having the tactile experience of a paper Bible, and I strongly recommend it. It, it, it will help. So next, have a passage. Well, what do you mean? What are you going to read? Part of your plan needs to include the passage you're going to read. Know where you're going. Maybe you follow a through the Bible plan. My brother is going through a Bible in the year plan that he's got. Uh, they're out there. I'll get you one if you want one. Maybe you focus on the Gospels. Maybe you focus on the poetry, Psalms and Proverbs. But you need to have an idea about where you're going to crack open your word. Those randomly generated verse of the day things in your phone, hey, those are cool, right? Except uh, the Bible app doesn't give you consistency of seeing the word unfold. So whether you read a section, whether you read, uh, whether you read the whole book, have an idea of where you're going to go. If you're not sure where to start, look, go read Luke and go straight to Acts, okay? Written by the same guy. Read Genesis and Exodus and Joshua. If you get stuck on boring genealogies, I'm giving you permission to skip them and come back to them later. Or here's, here's a suggestion. My brother, he started reading that. He's going through it now. He said, I've been reading them out loud. It's easier if I read them out loud. I think you need to read them like an old Jewish grandma. Then they'll, <laughs> it'll sound right. It'll sound authentic, okay? But look, get the big picture. Then you can dive into the details. Just have a plan. And I find, and I find, look, I find the days that I finish a book are the hardest to, to read if I don't know what I'm doing next. Like I just finished Galatians, and tomorrow it's Ephesians. Next, have a pen and paper. Why? For notes, for underlining, in journaling. Again, paper wins out over your notes app. It's just how our brains work. You retain more through writing than typing. Have a pen to make notes in your Bible and in your journal. It's a powerful way to engage with Scripture. And if you think it's sacrilege to write in your Bible, call me a heathen because it's important. And I used to think that way until I realized it was a way for me to appreciate the written word and really focus in on it. And... I use my journal for thoughts, for reflections, for prayers, and it helps me focus, because I'm very ADD, by the way, and also gives me something to look back on later. Journaling used to be really, really hard for me. I struggled. I struggled with journaling. Uh, But something clicked one day. I find it encouraging, helpful, even cathartic sometimes, just to write stuff down, right, just to get it out. I just wish I had the focus to do it years ago. And it would be a joy to look back on some of those old prayers and see God's, God's faithfulness. And the last thing, have a prayer. You say, what do you mean have a prayer? Well, just your prayers don't have to be perfect, just reflections of your heart. If you're going to have quiet time with God, just take a few minutes. Sometimes you'll worship. Sometimes you'll share how you're feeling. Sometimes you'll just say help. That's okay. That is a prayer. And as you grow in the Lord, your prayers will grow as well. A prayer involves two things. It's talking and it's listening. You need to talk to God through worship, through thanksgiving. You need to make your request known to him, but you need to listen through his word and the spirit of God. So remove distractions and quiet your heart. Well, so what? I want to get to a few minutes of discussion time. I'm I'm not trying to give you more to do, okay? So listen to what I'm saying. I'm trying to help get you back to the basics of what we're supposed to be doing, which is what? Walking humbly with God. So don't get upset if you don't have a quiet time every day or the plan falls apart. That's why I say just work on it every day. Try again in the morning. Totally acceptable. It's because the growth that comes from God's word, what? It comes from God himself. And if that's true, then it's better to do a quiet time imperfectly than not do it at all. No such thing as a perfect quiet time. Just spend time with God. You might stumble a little bit. You might feel like you're crawling sometimes. But guess what happens when you're stumbling and crawling? You're still moving forward. Okay? And that's what it's going to take you somewhere. All that is going to take you somewhere. But once you get there... You'll never want to go back. All right? All right, try to be practical. Let me pray for us, and then do some discussion. We'll wrap up in about 20 minutes. Father, thank you for the time and the word. 